Dave Walker was appointed by Democrats. He was appointed by Republicans. And he served during four presidential administrations. We are so honored to have him up on the hill. I think, I truly believe you're in for a treat. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Dave Walker to the stage. All right, is my microphone working? Can everybody hear me in the far right, far left? Everything okay? All right, very good. Uh, I didn't mean politically, I meant geographically. Uh, but anyway. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Arizona. Arizona is a lovely state. My son, Andy, uh, who uh, used to live in Arizona for a number of years when he was working uh, at Honeywell. He lived in Scottsdale, and that's a, that's a lovely part of the state. I realize your microclimate here is quite a bit different, and frankly, probably more along the lines of what I would like uh, should I ever move to Arizona, where you actually get a change of seasons, and obviously it's a beautiful place. Uh, I want to uh, thank President Ching, I want to thank uh, Don Garner, I want to thank Wade, uh, I want to acknowledge Mayor Evans who's here today and the other elected officials. Uh, you had some great PowerPoint presentations. Uh, as a result, I'm not going to continue that because I don't want to risk death through PowerPoint. Uh, but, but I do have some data that I want to convey to you and I want to make sure that I save plenty of time for uh, the Q&A. I want to thank the three amigos for going before me, uh, and I want a copy of each and every one of their PowerPoint presentations because I thought they had some very uh, interesting information in there. I've been asked to talk to you about a fiscal outlook, and I'm going to try to do that by talking about the past, the present, and the future. You know, I've heard somebody tell me that this is the half-empty conference, uh, but, but I think when you're half-empty, you're also half-full. Uh, and I think it's important that we be able to put things in context. Uh, what I hope to do is to kind of provide a wake-up call, uh, but some hope, and a way forward is what do we need to do to create a better future nationally and to a certain extent with regard to states and localities. I will focus primarily on the federal government, but I will have some comments on state and local governments, and there are some common denominators with regard to the challenges that we face at the federal, state, and local level. And let me start out with a provocative statement that deals with the federal government for sure, my state government and many other state governments, and my local government and many other local governments, but not necessarily yours. Government has grown too big, promised too much, and needs to restructure. the greatest political document in the history of mankind is the Constitution of the United States. And we need to go back to that founding document of our great republic and look at some of the language that's in the preamble of the Constitution to provide some context as to what the federal government is supposed to do. And let me, with your indulgence, read the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. We the people, the most important words in the Constitution are the first three. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. I would respectfully suggest there's a difference between the word provide and promote uh, and establish and secure. And let, if you look over time as to what's happened to the federal government, you will see a few things. In the last 100 years, the federal government has gone from 2% of the U.S. economy to 21%. For those of you that are proficient at math, that's 10 and a half times bigger than it was 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, the Congress of the United States controlled 97% of annual federal spending. Stated differently, only 3% of spending was on autopilot. Uh, today, 70% of spending is on autopilot and growing faster than the rest of the budget. And interestingly, when you look at the part of the budget that is so-called discretionary spending, 
meaning the part of the budget that is controlled by the Congress through the appropriations process uh, each year, you will find that it includes every express and enumerated responsibility envisioned by our founding fathers in the Constitution of the United States. National defense, homeland security, judicial system of the United States, Congress of the United States, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone. So what's happened is government has grown bigger. It's taken on more responsibility. Uh, and, and it's lost control of the budget. And what about states' rights? They have been eviscerated. And I would respectfully suggest that the year 1913 was a very consequential year, that the three things happened in 1913 that served to increase the size and scope of the federal government and undercut states' rights. Number one, the income tax. Number two, the establishment of the Federal Reserve. And number three, U.S. Senators became directly elected by the people rather than appointed by state legislators, which legislatures, which means that they could pander and they could be populist uh, and, rather than protect states' rights. Because when they were appointed by state legislatures, if they did not so if they did not protect states' rights, they did not get reappointed. Uh, and so those things happened in 1913. You know, our position in the world was obviously very different in 1913 than it is today. But let's look from the fiscal front at what's happened with regard to the debt as an illustration. Uh, you know, between George Washington, our first president, and William Jefferson Clinton, we accumulated $5.7 trillion in debt. And then with George Walker Bush, Bush number two, Barack Obama, and now the beginning of uh, uh, President Trump, we've gone from $5.7 trillion to $20 trillion and counting. You can do the math. The fact of the matter is, is that we're out of control. And the fact is, the $5.7 trillion doesn't truly reflect where we are. Because that $5.7 trillion, uh, probably the, two, the $20 trillion, does not truly reflect where we are because it doesn't include such things as unfunded civilian and military pensions and retiree health care, accrued environmental cleanup costs, the difference between what we promised for Social Security uh, and Medicare and the revenue streams that we're expected to have over the next 75 years, which is how long the trustees have to estimate. I was a trustee of Social Security and Medicare for five years, among other things. And so the real number is not 20 trillion. The real number, depending upon what, if you just go the 75 year time frame, I can make it worse if you want to go perpetuity, but only <laughs> God knows when we're gonna, when the end of time is and he's not telling us, all right? So I'll go 75 years. It's more like 80 trillion, 80 trillion dollars, and counting. Now, when I was Comptroller General of the United States, which in English is the Auditor General of the United States, and the Chief of uh, Performance and Accountability Office of the United States, and the CEO of something called the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO. The first four years that I was Comptroller General, we had a surplus. First time in a long time that we had a surplus. The tragic events of September 11, 2001 had obvious consequences with regard to our fiscal situation and our security posture. But the fact is, is I believe that 2003 was the year where we really started to spend out of control. And why do I say that? Three things happened. You'll hear a lot of three things. I spent some time at Harvard. They taught me people can't remember more than three things. So, so I, I try to stick it with three, right? All right. But it just so happens that this is accurate. Three. Uh, number one, we had a second round of tax cuts that, that were debt financed that we could not afford, that did not pay for themselves. Number two, we invaded a sovereign nation without declaring war and putting it on the credit card. It's called Iraq. And our son, Andy, was a Marine Corps officer who fought in Iraq, and fortunately he was fine. And then number three, we expanded Medicare to add prescription drugs, to add $9 trillion in new unfunded obligations 
when Medicare was already underfunded $19 trillion at the time. That was largely done for political reasons rather than for policy reasons. But the fact of the matter is each one of those things arguably was inappropriate, but collectively was almost incomprehensible. And ever since then, we've pretty much been out of control. Now, first, a lot of people talk about deficits. As you know, deficits are the difference between how much in revenues we take in in a year and how much we spend, and government accounting typically is cash or, or modified cash basis. So there's a lot of things you can do to play with the numbers. You can accelerate revenues, you can defer expenses, and you know, if you're really out of control and you want to balance the budget, which some states and localities call it balancing cash flows, like my state, and if you're really in, in trouble, you can raid all the trust funds, and you can borrow money. And that can balance the cash, but that's not a balanced budget. You know, there's a difference between the cash basis and accrual basis. So first we have deficits, then we have debt, which is the accumulated results of operations over time, plus whatever, you know, capital expenditures that we're making, things of that nature. And, uh, and, and then, but to me, what matters is not deficits per se, because you're going to run deficits from time to time. If you've got a recession, if you've got a war, if you've got a national emergency, uh, you know, it's understandable that you're running deficits. Not all debt is bad. If you're taking on debt in order to improve the nation's critical infrastructure, if you're taking on debt in order to be able to enhance our human capital, uh, if, if you're taking on debt for purposes that can benefit multiple generations and, and they make economic sense when you're doing it, that's not all bad. But when you run deficits year after year in times of economic recovery, in peacetime, when you end up taking on debt in circumstances that have nothing to do with investments for the future, that is fundamentally imprudent, irresponsible, unethical in certain circumstances, and I would argue for our children, grandchildren, and future generations, immoral. When you get to the point where you are borrowing to provide for today at the expense of tomorrow, you know, we've all heard the old story, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the person behind the tree. Now it's don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the baby on my knee, who does not have an opportunity to express their opinion. But the fact is we still have huge deficits. So to me, what matters is not deficits and not debt per se. What matters is debt as a percentage of the economy. How much debt do we have as compared to the economy? Now let's talk about that for a minute. In order to defeat the most powerful military force on the face of the earth and create this document, total debt to GDP, including debt assumed of the states, which was part of the compromise that led to the, the, the ratification of the Constitution, was 35% of debt to GDP. And throughout most of our history, through wars, through recessions, through depressions, federal public debt as a percentage of GDP never exceeded 30 to 40, 35 to 40% of the economy. Why? Because we were fiscally responsible, we were growing the economy faster than the debt, and we cared about a word that we don't seem to care much about anymore. It's called stewardship. Stewardship says that as a leader, our responsibility is not just to generate positive results today. It's not just to leave things better off today, when, be, better off when you leave than when you came. It's to leave things better positioned for the future. That's what stewardship is. And we are not discharging that responsibility, at least in government in many cases, the federal level, uh, in some states and localities uh, as, as we need to, and as we have an ethical and moral responsibility to do, in my, in my view. So, so what's happened is, then we had World War II. At the end of World War II, we had public debt to GDP of about 105%, the highest we've ever had. Now that's public debt, not total debt, debt held by the public. But guess what happened? 
You know, we were betting the ranch. We avoided attack on our homeland. I'm talking about the continental United States because Hawaii was not a state at that point in time. We saved the free world. And after World War II, we became fiscally responsible again. We invested in human capital. We invested in critical infrastructure. And we grew the economy much, much faster than the debt. And in fact, we went from about 104% of GDP in 1946 down to about 30 or so in 1980. And we didn't pay off a dollar of debt because we grew the economy faster than the debt and debt to GDP declined. But now debt to GDP, just the public debt, is about 80%. And when you count what we owe Social Security, Medicare, and other so-called trust funds, I put them in quotes because it's like trust the government funds. <laughs> Do you know what's in trust funds? Debt of the government. That's the truth, all right? So the fact is, is that, you know, when you add that, it's about, you know, 105% to 110% of GDP and rising. And rising in the face of some of these economic factors that our prior panelists talked about, including the fact that demographics are destiny. You know, the world has changed since World War II. At the end of World War II, the United States was over 50% of global GDP. We had 16 people working for every person who was on Social Security. And the dollar was as good as gold. Today, we're about 22% of global GDP. We have about 3.1 persons working for every person retired. And it's going to go down to 2 to 1 by 2035. And let's just say the dollar is not as good as gold. And I'm not talking about the gold standard. So the fact is, the world's a different place. And now we're in a situation where 70% of our budget is on autopilot. Autopilot. And that includes Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, agricultural subsidies, interest on the debt. And something that a lot of people don't ever talk about. We spend $1.3 trillion a year on tax preferences. Deductions, exemptions, exclusions, credits through the corporate and individual tax code. That's backdoor spending. And yet it's not part of the budget. It's not part of the financial statements. It's not periodically reviewed and reconsidered. And every spending program should be re reviewed and reconsidered on a cost-benefit basis. And what value do we get? And so should every tax preference. And that's part of the debate with regard to tax reform. So bottom line. We've lost control of the budget. Government's too big, it's promised too much, it needs to restructure. So given that, I embarked in 2012, after I wrote the national best-selling book, Come Back America, which laid out where we are and what do we need to do to create a better future, I had a hypothesis. My hypothesis was the American people were a lot smarter than the politicians realized. They know that things are out of control. They're disgusted with the gridlock in Washington. They know you can't spend more money than you make, charge to the credit card, self-deal in your own debt forever without having a day of reckoning. And so therefore, I went on a 27-state, 10,000-mile fiscal responsibility bus tour, which included Arizona, and a stop at the University of Arizona uh, in Tucson, OK? And I engaged with, with business groups, with retiree groups, with college students, with a variety of others to try to be able to help to tell them the truth, talk about the tough choices, and bring people together. And I did two special forums, which I'm going to talk about now. I did two special forums, one outside of Cleveland, Ohio, in a swing congressional district in a swing state, one outside of Washington, D.C., in Northern Virginia, in a swing congressional district in a swing state, and I partnered with Alice Rivlin, who was former head of the Congressional Budget Office, former head of the Office of Management and Budget, former vice chair of the Fed, good friend of mine. In fact, we just gave a, sp a speech two weeks ago uh, in Ohio together. Uh, and we partnered to engage with a representative group of voters, demographically representative, 
age, race, income, political affiliation, et cetera, outside of Ohio and outside of Virginia to try to see, to test that hypothesis. And here's what we did. We spent over a half a day with them, and we tried to get them to agree on first, do we have a problem that needs to be solved sooner rather than later? 97% agreement. Number two, is this, are we gonna grow our way out of this problem? 8% felt we would grow our way out of the problem. Now don't get me wrong, I'm all for more economic growth and there's a number of things that we need to do to get more economic growth, but there's a new four letter word in fiscal policy. It's called math. <laughs> and if you calculate what, e what compounded economic growth rate you would have in order to grow our way out of this problem, given known demographic trends and rising health care costs, we ain't getting there. We're not getting there. Now, we need to do a better job, and we can do a better job, uh, but we're not getting there. So we're going to have to make some tough choices, all right? So then what we said was, okay, what should our goal be? And at that time, I said, let's get public debt to GDP down to 60%. At that time, I said by 2030. Now you got to say 2035 to 2040 because they've basically done nothing. Done nothing, basically. All right? Uh, and, and why 60%? Because there's pretty much consensus among mainstream economists that 60% of public debt to GDP is reasonable. It gives you some flexibility. It happens to also to be the measure that's used by the European Union. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. But at least there's some consensus about that. So again, coming back to what I said, pro-growth policies, but fiscal responsible policies, we're out of control of the budget. So the next thing I said was, OK, what percentage of this should come through spending reductions? And what percentage should come through revenue enhancements? Not necessarily tax rate increases, OK? And by the way, there was 92% agreement on the 60% of debt to GDP. Again, this is across the spectrum. And the answer was three to one. Three parts spending reduction. The government's grown too big, promised too much. We've got to get that under control. But we need a sound, secure association in that. Uh, three to one, 92%. Uh, and the next was, OK, we know we've got to make some tough choices. So let's come up with some principles and values that will bring people together rather than divide them apart. And those principles and values were the six, the following six. We want reforms that will achieve the objective within the specified time frame with the rough balance of spending reductions to revenue increases that, was, that were agreed to that meet six criteria. Number one, pro-growth. You want to grow the economy faster than the debt. And you got to grow it much faster than the debt in order to get debt to GDP down from 80 to 60 by a date certain. All right. Secondly, socially equitable. We need a solvent, sustainable, and secure social safety net in this country for those who are truly in need. We need some level of universal health care in this country, but not what we're talking about right now. And you can come back to me on Q&A because we're having the wrong debate about health care right now in Washington. We spend two and a half times per person on health care that other industrialized nations do, and we get below average results. And costs are still growing much faster than the economy and much faster than inflation. It's not a money problem. That system, the health care system, and the, and the K through 12 education system, which is the same, we spend two and a half times as much and we get below average outcomes. Those two systems, it's not money. We don't have the right incentives, transparency, and accountability mechanisms. Because you can throw money at a system that's generating those kinds of results, and you're just wasting money. You have to re-engineer those two, two systems in order to achieve uh, more acceptable results and a, and a sustainable future. So, so the second was social equity. Second was cultural acceptability. Hey, you know, we're not Europe. We're not a socialist country. We're a country of opportunity. Equal opportunity, not equal result. 
And the fact is, is that we're not going to allow ourselves to be taxed at the same rate as Scandinavian countries. We might have to have higher revenues, yeah, we are, to make the numbers work. But there's a limit as to how much the American people will accept uh, and that can be sustained over time. The next fa factor was mathematical integrity. That's that four-letter word, math. You have to have a plan that deals with revenues and expen expenses that where the math works based on reasonable assumptions and without creative accounting. The next was political feasibility. You got to pass the Senate, which unless you do budget reconciliation, takes 60 votes. You got to pass a House, which is a mere majority. You can do a cram down on the minority if you want, not the way to do it, but you can. And you got to get the signature of the President of the United States unless you can end up getting override a veto, and that's two thirds majority in each house. And then the last, which sounds a little redundant to, to the one that I just mentioned, but it's really not. You need meaningful bipartisan support. You need to get at least 20% of the minority party to buy in. That's, a, that's a, not, a, not a sophisticated estimate. You can't sustain major changes based on one party vote. You just can't because we're too evenly divided in, in this country. And so you need to have some meaningful bipartisan support, number one, to be sustainable, and secondly, for the American people to deem it to be fair. Now, after we did this, we've got all this agreement, then we did the following. And this could prompt some questions from the audience. We then said, okay, what kind of budget reforms do we need to make? What kind of Social Security reforms do we need to make? What kind of Medicare and Medicaid reforms do we need to make? What kind of health care reforms do we need to make? What kind of defense reforms do we need to make? What type of government organization operational reforms do we need to make? And what type of political reforms do we need to make in order to restore a representative and responsive republic? Because in my opinion today, we have a republic that is not representative of nor responsive to the public. And we need political reforms in order to revitalize our republic, to enhance our democracy, and to be able to make some of the tough choices that need to be made combined with presidential leadership, which I will come back to. Uh, so what are some of the things we talked about, and I'll top line it. There's one express and enumerated responsibility for the Congress of the United States every year. It's to enact appropriations that should be guided by a budget. The budget wasn't in the Constitution, appropriations are. You know how many times the Congress has passed timely budgets and appropriations bills by the beginning of the fiscal year in my lifetime? The answer is four. Four. F minus. F minus, all right? So we need to think, we, we, we need budget reforms, which includes going to biennial budgeting, separating the operating budget from the capital budget. Uh, we need to eliminate the debt ceiling. It hasn't worked. It's not going to work. We need to go to debt to, de debt to GDP with automatic targets and triggers and enforcement mechanisms if we don't hit it, which promote pro-growth policies but fiscal responsibility. And if you want to do things on a dynamic scoring, then fine, but you better hit your dang numbers. Because if you don't hit your numbers, there's going to be consequences. Secondly, we then talked about Social Security, which, by the way, young people here, you're going to get Social Security. Because even when the so-called trust fund goes to zero, about 2031, there's about 75 cents in revenues for every dollar of expenditures. We're not going to cut everybody across the board. Theoretically, that's what you do. That'd be pretty stupid. Uh, but we can reform it to make it solvent, sustainable, secure, indefinitely. It is the foundation of retirement income security. It is the thing that is the most popular program in America. But guess when the last time that we reformed it was? 1983. And guess why we reformed it in 1983? Because the checks weren't going to go out on time. Within a matter of weeks, the trust fund was going to zero. And I can assure you that it's politically unacceptable for tens of millions of Americans not to get their Social Security uh, you know, payment on time. Now they're mostly electronic, OK? But the fact is, the modern-day equivalent of that is 2031. 
you know, it'd be stupid to wait till then, but you know, who knows, they, they could. Uh, the sooner we do it, the less change we have to have, the more certainty people have in planning for their own future, the more transition time that we have, and I believe that the system will ultimately be maintain the defined benefit system, which it should, with somewhat later retirement ages, with somewhat different indexing formula, with the raising of the, of the, uh, of the taxable wage base cap, but not an elimination of the taxable wage base cap, we can, and, and with a supplemental individual savings account on top, uh, kind of a super federal for a savings plan, if you will, because our savings rate's too, too low, and it was never intended that Social Security was going to be the primary form of retirement income, like a house that was supposed to be a foundation that you build on in order to have a habitable dwelling. Uh, a few other examples uh, you know, with regard to uh, health care. I think we're having the wrong debate on health care. We promise way more than we can deliver on in health care. And yet, we need to have an honest discussion and debate about how much universal health care should be available to every American, irrespective of their age, irrespective of their income. That is a national responsibility with a single risk pool, publicly financed, uh, delivered with, with much more focus on, on quality and outcomes than activities, uh, with transparency and accountability, delivered through uh, the private sector and the not-for-profit sector, not, not by the government. And to me, what that is, it's, it's prevention, it's wellness, and it's catastrophic coverage for everybody. The government's always going to do more for the poor, but for a vast majority of the population, that is what the broad-based societal need is. There's unlimited individual wants for health care. Let's focus on meeting the broad-based societal need, which we can do in an affordable, sustainable way, provide mechanisms for people to get more than that if they want through their employer, through their union, through the professional trade association, through doing things across borders, through more competition. Let's do that. Then we can meet broad-based societal needs and we can deliver on the promise because right now what we have is we promised way too much uh, and we're not going to be able to deliver and that's not what you want to do. Uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to taxes, there was broad-based agreement. Oh, oh, by the way, the least agreement was 77% of all these things I'm talking about. Least agreement was 70. Most of them were 80 to 90% plus. All right. With regard to taxes, broaden the base, lower the rates, significantly reduce the number of deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions. The objective was we want a simpler, fairer, and more competitive tax code. Examples on the corporate side, uh, go to territorial form of taxation rather than global form of taxation. It's a huge competitive disadvantage for us. Secondly, take the top corporate tax rate down to 25 percent. Significantly reduce the number of preferences, but one example of an additional preference that you would allow is provide for a deduction for dividends distributed to shareholders. Why? because they're already taxed at the individual level and that would put boards of directors in a position to either be able to invest for growth and jobs or distribute for growth and jobs. There's a huge amount of money, patient capital that's hanging up on balance sheets of corporations that's not being put to use. There's a lot of money overseas that could be repatriated and we don't just want to do these one-time stop gaps where you give a temporary, we need to move to territorial rather than global like it most every other major industrialized nation has already. And on the individual side, you want to get to where 90% of Americans can view their tax return on one piece of paper. May have to be two sides, but you know, at least it's one sheet of paper, okay? I mean, you know, and we really, and what, what were the deductions, what, what are the preferences that people care about the most? Again, fewer rates, uh, try to get the top tax rate down from 25 to 28%. 25 to 20, the top tax rate. And if you can get the top tax tax rate down, down there, you can also do something about capital gains, about whether or not there should be a differential there. You know, what are the deductions that you need to keep? Interest on a primary mortgage up to the maximum conforming loan, which 
varies by region of the country, but nowhere is a million dollars, nor should you get one on a second home. Second homes are a want, not a need. All right? Secondly, charitable contributions. Unlimited to bona fide charities. Why? Because the government's going to do less. Charities have to do more. We want to encourage philanthropy, not discourage philanthropy. And in addition to that, appropriate levels of savings for retirement because we're not going to be able to get there just through public programs. And that's why I think these games where we try to say, well, we're going to limit how much you can save on a tax, uh, on a tax deductible basis, but, but we'll, we'll end up not taxing it uh, when it comes out. That's stupid. Why is that stupid? Because what that does is it plays games with the numbers. It helps you on the budget in the short term. It makes it worse over the long term. And the way that we are right now, because of known demographic trends, rising health care costs, anemic economic growth, et cetera, our problems get worse with the passage of time, not better. Uh, with regard to the Defense Department, look, we need more money for, for, for to improve readiness, but the Defense Department has a huge amount of waste, huge, and it's about time that we took that on. It is a bloated bureaucracy that needs to be taken head on. Uh, and we can save many billions of dollars uh, if we do it. Uh, and I'll give one other example on the political, then I'll give you a couple of things about state, local, and we'll go to Q&A. On the political, we need redistricting reform, where the purpose of redistricting is to maximize the number of competitive districts consistent with the Voting Rights Act, not to minimize the number of competitive districts consistent with the Voting Rights Act. We need integrated open primaries. You can be a Republican, a Democrat, an unaffiliated, whatever you want to be. Everybody votes in the primary. You either have the top two runoff in the general or you have a ranked voting system, either one. We need campaign financial reform. We need reasonable term limits. I would suggest 12 years for, uh, uh, for, uh, for legislative officials and eight years for executive branch officials. Uh, these, and we need lobbying reform because there's still a huge revolving door problem which creates great conflicts of interest uh, and enhances the rights of special interest which is not in the public interest. So let me now turn to the state. Let me just say this. There are several key challenges that exist at every level of government. Tax reform, regulatory relief, retirement obligations, unfunded retirement obligations, infrastructure, deteriorating infrastructure, inadequate education and training systems, and out of control health care costs. Those exist at every levels of government to differing degrees. We need comprehensive and integrated solutions to those while, re while respecting uh, the sovereignty of, of the states and the fact that they're supposed to be petri dishes to, to experiment so that we at the national level can benefit and hopefully do the right thing over time, uh, as Churchill said. Uh, so, so what about are some of the numbers? I rank the states every year for PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I rank them on three bases, relative financial position, which includes both on and off balance sheet obligations, uh, their competitive posture, relative competitive posture, and what are their migration patterns. I'm going to benchmark Arizona and Connecticut. I live in Connecticut. You live in Arizona. Uh, Arizona is number 21 out of 50 in relative financial position. Connecticut's 47. Arizona is in the second uh, Quintile of, of 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 ranking, so you're you know you're some second uh, of, of so you're in the second tier of five tiers for competitiveness. We're in tier five, which is the worst. You have positive net migration. We have negative net migration to the point of a declining population. Now your positive net migration is not what it used to be. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's still positive. Okay, uh, and hopefully it'll get back to what you're like. Now let's talk about cities. Flagstaff and Bridgeport. Flagstaff has a population of about 71,000. Bridgeport, which is the largest city in Connecticut, believe it or not, 147,000 people. And I live in Bridgeport. Uh, me median household income in Flagstaff, 48,680. Median household income, 41,809. Total unfunded retirement obligations based upon more reasonable rate of return assumptions as used by Moody's, which are 5.5%, not 8%, 7.5%. Uh, 
about 225 million. That's both pensions and retiree health care. Uh, for Bridgeport, two billion dollars. <laughs> two billion dollars. I don't know what your property tax rate is, but I know it's not what ours is. Ours is, uh, we have a effective tax rate, property tax rate of over 3% of the value of your home. That's like selling your home every two years and you don't sell it. And guess what happens when property taxes go up? Home values go down. And keep in mind the law of gravity. Bad news flows downhill. So the federal government needs to get its act together. It needs to start making tough choices sooner rather than later. And to the extent that it doesn't, bad news flows downhill to the states and to the localities, creating more uncertainty, uh, if you will. The biggest deficit this country has is not a budget deficit. It's a leadership deficit. And the fact of the matter is, it's time to recognize reality, to state the facts, speak the truth, provide some hope, talk about the tough choices, and provide a way forward at all levels of government. And that's got to be done by the president, that's got to be done by the governor, and that's got to be done by the mayor uh, and, and respective ones. Because you can't run a country by committee and legislative bodies or committees. And nobody's in charge of the committee. People are in charge of factions within the committee called political parties, but not the body of the whole. Uh, and so good news is we're the greatest country on the face of the earth. I've been to 100 of them. Uh, there, there's no place else I would rather leave, leave. We can solve this problem. And all of you have a stake in it, and your kids and grandkids, to the extent that you have it, have an even bigger stake in it. So I'll do my part. All that I ask is you do yours, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dave. You, you definitely got people excited. I've got a handful of questions here. I read them as they were coming in. They're all really good. So in the event to not get anyone angry at me, I just shuffled them up, and here we go. Uh, the first one, do you see public sector pensions becoming a greater drain on the economy? And if so, what can be done about it? I'll take my state as an example. 80% of the financial challenge in Connecticut is underfunded pensions and un unfunded retiree health care benefits. 80%. There's been collusion for too many years between career politicians of both political parties and public sector labor union leaders to promise unreasonable, unaffordable, unsustainable benefits and not fund them. And now things are out of control, out of control. And the result is pressure to reduce education spending pressure to reduce, to shred the social safety net, pressure to not invest in critical infrastructure, pressure for higher property taxes, pressure for higher income taxes and other taxes and fees. States have to compete. Most Americans don't want to leave America, but people will leave a state and a locality no problem. And they're already, in many, too many cases, voting with their feet. In many cases, coming here, maybe. Uh, but the fact is, yes, it's a real problem, okay? And, 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 and the fact is, is that we're going to need to restructure the existing obligations in an equitable way. Uh, you can't keep the status quo. You don't want to reduce somebody's current pension payment or accrued benefit, but you have to immediately eliminate abuses, and we have to dramatically restructure our retiree health care plans because they're much more generous than a Fortune 100 company, they're not affordable, they're not sustainable, they're not equitable. But after we do this, then we have to have a hard and steadfast commitment to fund so that people will get what they've been promised. Because right now what's happening in all too many cases, they've been promised the sun, moon, and the stars, but they're not going to get it. And that's not right. Next. Second question is most of, uh, a lot has been made today about the corporate tax rate being too high. However, according to CBO estimates, the effective corporate tax rate is only 18.6%. So is the corporate tax rate truly too high? Well, the effective tax rate is what you actually pay, okay? And, and I think we can't take our, 
and can't take our eyes off that ball. Look, what's too high is the, uh, the top corporate tax rate, which is the highest in the world, I believe, at this point in time, statutory rates, the highest rate. What's, what's also a problem is the fact that we tie ta tax on global profits with, with an offset on what you pay elsewhere rather than, uh, rather than on territorial profits, meaning what are you making in the United States. What's also a problem is that we've got all kinds of special deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions that play favorites that end up costing us a lot of money, and in many cases, we don't get value for money for it. So I think the bottom line is, is both on the corporate side and the individual side, you, you want to you make it more competitive, which means a lower rate, fewer preferences, go to a territorial system versus, versus a, uh, a global system, uh, uh, and, I, I, and then, we'll see how the, then we'll see how the effective tax rate plays out. So PE ratios are high. Capital has been used to acquire back, to buy back shares. Yeah. There has been minimal investment in long-term uh, long growth. How do you ultimately see this affecting the economy and the stock market? Well, that's one of the reasons that I want to provide a deduction for dividends yeah. distributed. OK? I mean, I think that is, I'd rather have a 25% corporate tax rate and provide a deduction for dividends distributed then have a 20% corporate tax rate and not provide any deduction for dividends distributed. I mean, you know, question, I mean, buying back shares and not doing much for the economy, unless I'm missing something. The economists think I'm missing something? I don't think so, okay? My point is what we need to do is we need to get these corporations to either invest for growth and jobs or distribute for growth and jobs. Uh, and, you know, the tax, the tax system can either, can, can either enhance economic growth or inhibit the economic growth. And by the way, I agree wholeheartedly about the regulatory overreach. Uh, that is a huge issue which costs economic growth, which, which, which affects both businesses and consumers, and we've got to get control of that. It has been estimated that the proposed tax reform will add <coughs> 1.4 to 1.6 trillion to national debt. Your thoughts? Well, my understanding is it's estimated, the House bill is estimated to add 1.7 trillion uh, to the deficit and therefore presumably the debt uh, because we're, we're in a deficit situation. Over the, over the next 10 years, uh, the, the House budget resolution said 1.5, so they're over what they said. Look, here's the key to me. What does it do to debt to GDP? What does it do to debt to GDP now? But on, on, on an enforceable basis, on the Missouri test, trust but verify, Okay, by the Reagan test. And so therefore, in theory, and the economists can run the numbers just like us CPAs can run the numbers, you know, in theory, if you got 1% more economic growth compounded over 10 years, you'd be growing the economy faster than the debt, even though the deficits would be going up, all right? And that's what really matters. The problem is we need accountability mechanisms to make sure that we're not just going on a pipe dream, that we hold people accountable. And secondly, we got to deal with that 70% of spending that, that is out of control. We've written a blank check for 70% of the budget. We've got to get control of that, and, and sooner rather than later. So the author of this question says, I really like your ideas. What are the probability that at least half <laughs> of them can be carried out in the next 10 years? Oh, 10 years. OK, well, that's a reasonable horizon. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think I, I, I think there is there is hope that at least half of them can be carried out within ten years. But I'll come back to what I said. In order for these things to happen, the president needs to make this a top priority, whoever the president is. The president needs to engage the American people through use of the bully pulpit. Uh, you need to go outside the beltway. Uh, rather than trying to come with top-down, inside-the-beltway solutions, that doesn't work. There are too many people in Washington that are career politicians who don't really know how the real world works, even though they're good people. We're so far away from what George Washington and our founders intended, where you have people who have real jobs in the real world that leave their real jobs in the real world for a short period of time to do temporary public service and then go back to their real jobs in the real world. 
And now all too frequently we have situations where people in Washington state capitals or whatever, they're just not in touch. So I think if we can get a president that will make this a priority, who will use the bully pulpit like Reagan did, who will engage the people, even to a great extent that Reagan did, okay? Frankly, Bill Clinton tried to do this in 1998. I was part of that effort before I was Comptroller General. He wanted to reform Social Security as part of his legacy. And we started having public forums. We had them in three cities around the country. Either he or the Vice President participated. I was kind of the truth teller to lay things out. And I think we would have had it in 1999 but for his personal problems. And, this, and the fact of the matter is, the reforms that we're going to get are basically going to be the same as what we were thinking about then. They're just going to be decades later. That's just irresponsible. It shouldn't be that way. So I have a whole handful of questions here, and I thank you for your, but I, we just don't have time to get to them all, but I'm going to end up with one last question. Do you think the corporate tax redu reductions will actually outweigh the low labor and production costs abroad and allow us to bring home large corporations to the U.S.? <clears throat> It will help, but it's not a panacea, okay? You have to understand, we have to focus on what the future economy is, not what the past economy is, all right? The United States cannot compete based on cost. We're going to get beat every day of the week if we try to compete on cost. We have to compete on innovation, on productivity, on quality, on value added. Uh, you know, that's, that's how we have to compete. And that means that our tax structures, our regulatory structures, our immigration policies, our education systems, our training systems, all have to be re-engineered accordingly. We, we are living based upon the past rather than preparing for a better future. How about a round of applause? Again, thank you so much for joining us at the 42nd Alliance Bank Economic Policy Institute Conference. We look so forward to next year.